Stefan, thanks so much for coming by. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Chris. Nice studio here you got. They've done a really good job here with Blue Wire. And at the win, I'm sure it's a uh, pretty well, penny. Well, the win's a partner. So the win, it was the win's idea to like partner with Blue Wire, and this is what we've got. And then I take it, too. You, you do a show here, and you come in, they give you a room. That is how I'm flying. I flew in this morning. I'm doing three interviews today, and I fly out tomorrow. That is the life. I remember doing uh, stuff for the UFC here right after the show and then giving me a room, and it was, yeah, what a treat. It felt like a star. The rooms here are pretty nice, <laughs> pretty nice. How are you feeling? You were limping as you were coming in. Yeah, um, I am just getting off my deathbed uh, again. Like I got to keep having these near-death experiences, man. It's fucking killing me. But, uh, yeah, I, I got severely injured, a uh, broken vertebrae in the lumbar spine, a broken wrist, and a uh, blown-out knee. And I uh, was hospitalized for a while. Staph infection built up around the broken vertebrae. And, uh, yeah, it got really bad. So they wanted to keep me in there 10 weeks, was able to uh, negotiate a five-week stay, and then five weeks on the um, – pick line the antibiotic iv that they leave the line in your arm you have to get <laughs> administer them three times a day so um yeah that was uh probably the the most traumatic set of injuries i've had it hit all at once i was so swollen the staff was so painful i couldn't move i couldn't get up and down without help couldn't get off the toilet without help it was it was uh I talk about suffering. I'm mean, I just I'm thinking, you know, like, God, what did I really do to deserve that one? I mean, in the past, I've had my moments, but I've been pretty decent human being these last few years. And fucking, well, he laid one on me. So, uh, yeah, it made me <laughs> rethink my life a little bit. Did, did you actually feel like you were close to dying when you were in the hospital? Yeah, I went pretty delirious. Like my mind was like like going and was having visions and um, wow. was just really out of it, really loopy. And yeah, uh, I, I mean, I was kind of scared. Like, and that's what the doctor said. It's like the staff. It's really bad. And it's like uh, often we see the, you know, it leak uh, to the valves of the heart and then cause it cause you to die. Oh, that shut me up pretty quick. <laughs> So the like when you said you're delirious, is that what we're seeing in these videos, or or is that just you being? Yeah, angry that was and me, upset? desperate, and then me getting screwed over at the hospital where I, you know, I, that was another mistake. I should have had someone take me there and kind of take care of me, but no, I dragged myself there and crutched myself in and the broken wrist and waited in the ER a few hours and finally got up to the doctor and, uh, you know, he just treated me like. I, I was lying, you know, and I go, I have the x-rays, I have broken vertebrae, I have a broken wrist, like something's wrong, like I need treatment. And, uh, you know, well, have you been vaccinated? I'm like, no. Oh, okay, wait over here. He didn't say, oh, we're not going to see you now. And then a couple more hours go by where people keep going ba back uh, that came in after me. And I finally called him out on it. And he's like, I did see you. I'm like, you didn't treat me. I did treat you. And then I went off, you know, I just felt like kind of backed into a corner. And, uh, next thing you know, the th security's thrown me out of there and they knocked me over. I was crutch, not crutching fast enough. And I got a little nudge from behind my crutch went out and I fell and, uh, I just, got up and there was an open door there a bathroom and i locked myself in there and like oh my god like what's going on like i need to document some of this just like so i have the truth you know to show what's going on you know because i was afraid they were going to call the cops i mean which they did um did so i get out were, the bathroom and I, get arrested? I took that video yeah that's why you know when i talked to the cops outside i said you know i want you on video to tell me you're not just waiting for me to get in the car so you could pull me over because um, the I I didn't have my license on me. The the pharmacy accidentally kept it like the day before when I tried to get a prescription. Um, so I was I told them that and it was like uh, and they said, "Oh, you you got my word. We just want you to leave, or we won't pull you over." And they kept their word and uh, they didn't. And I went home and went to try to pull the videos down because I was using those videos to get out of there. Really, like. I'm just trying to go home, like, you know, like, I didn't want me to slap me with some bullshit, like, dist disturbing the peace or whatever, you know, um, disorderly conduct charge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what I was worried about. So I just wanted to document it. And when I went to try to pull it down, uh, 
my account was locked up and I'm kind of blanked out. Like you, my account and it shows nothing and it's like, I'm locked out of it. Although they left my account up, I can't get back into it. So I've been locked out of Instagram. Well, somebody needs to help you get it unlocked. Cause that is very much a part of your livelihood. I, right. I mean, yeah, it's, I think they're screwing me like one of the videos and they pulled that video down was me. Um, you know, uh, kind of bad mouth in the vaccine because I did. I talked to a lot of the people that came in after me and there were people that were having bad reactions from what they thought was the vaccine. And, um, you know, I just thought it was bullshit that like, uh, that was the question that kind of made them say, no, they're not going to treat me that I hadn't been vaccinated. And like the irony, all these people are coming in with reactions and you won't see me because I didn't have it yet. My issue's totally unrelated. Got a broken vertebrae in the, the wrist and knee, but like I didn't know the staph infection was there at the time. I just knew I needed treatment. Like I was in bad shape. Yeah. Like um, I was really out of it. And, uh, and after that too, after that fall and all that trauma and stress, like I went back and the inflammation got way worse. And the, uh, like the staph kind of really took hold, you know, just all that stress and um, aggravation on it, uh, made it way worse. And a couple of days later I went to another ER, which they t- took my blood right away and was like, within an hour of being there said, okay, you're going to be staying here for a while. You got something that's really bad. That's potentially fatal. Yeah. And it just, uh, re- re- really shocked me. And, um, it, and it's all because of pro wrestling. This is a pro wrestling injury. It was weird though. Um, it wasn't one of those things where like I finished the match and I felt all right. And, uh, you know, when I went back to the hotel, showered, crashed out. And when I woke up in the middle of the night, I felt it. I tried to stand up and I couldn't, you know, like, Oh my God. Mm -hmm. Um, it was like a delayed reaction in my spine there. And, um, yeah, I tried to tough it out. I went to you know, the orthopedic doctor that I see just to get x-rays to see what's going on. And then I figured, all right, you know, I had a, a, you know, a cast on my wrist and like, you can't really cast the spine. So, uh, just tried to tough it out, but little did I know I, you know, I had the staff and brewing in there uh, around the fracture in the spine. And that's really what got worse and unbearable. And here I am a week later when I finally decided to go to the ER, which I'm in way more pain than like the day after the accident. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Like this doesn't make sense. This isn't right. I need treatment. Like something's wrong. I didn't know what it was, but I knew something was wrong. And sure enough, it was, uh, yeah, and just to be treated like that, like I was making it up or just trying to get pain medicine was yeah, just they, so, it was just. just it, did they think you were pill shopping? Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, that's I, I kind of what I got out of it, you know, like, which like blew my mind because I had the proof of, you know, the injuries, you know, yeah. the x-rays here, man, <laughs> like <laughs> fucking x-rays, like, yeah. you know, like how many people are crutching around on broken lumbar vertebrae? That's, you know, I th- but once you start taking painkillers, that's such a slippery slope, I feel like, because you take one, then you got to take two and like, you're probably in a lot of pain still right now. Yeah, they're really good, though, about, you know, rationing. It's like the DEAs are involved, so they give you a script, and, you know, like, there's no way, like, you could get any more than they're prescribing you. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I don't know. I've had a ton of surgeries and a ton of injuries, so. The UFC record for surgeries, is that right? (laughs) Oh, yeah, I'm up there. Yeah. I think that's what, uh, that's Dana, what Dana said. said yeah. Like, I had the most injuries of anyone. I'm like, no way. Rich Franklin had to have more. Nope, you got rich. And then uh, when you get my medical records from Dr. Sanders, it's like a Bible. It really is. <laughs> can, you, can you list off pages. all your surgeries right now? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of them are on the knees. So I had four uh, knee scopes and... Uh, two reconstructive knee surgeries had a hand uh two hand surgeries elbow surgery uh nose surgery that's um, 10 already yeah i think that's i think that's it oh one more in the knee where it was just like uh, uh they, they just cleaned up the bone debris and smoothed out the joints and drilled holes <laughs> to get the bones to bleed a little bit it was more like a just like a cleanup operation, not really repairing uh, injury. It was just the arthritis was so unbearable. They went and like re- reshaped the joint and cleaned it out a little. Man, that's a lot of surgeries. 
yeah, I've always been really injury prone my whole life. Even growing up, my, um, my doctor, uh, my, our family doctor, Dr. Morris, would be like, oh, my God, kid, I see you more than I see my wife. Like, I've never seen anyone who's always breaking bones and, like, having to get stitches. And but are you doing, like, what kids are doing? Like, you're falling off a skateboard or falling out of a treehouse or something? And my dad would really let me have it. He's I've never broken. He was a good athlete. I've never broken a bone in my life. And look at you. You're 10 years old. You've broken five bones. <laughs> like, what? wrong with you mr glass <laughs> so yeah i just uh it's uh it's amazing that uh, well then then you decided to get into a profession where you I know, mean, yeah <laughs> that i had all, as long is, of a career as i did 14 yeah, years and then been pro wrestling about five so uh, yeah i you know when i think about it after this I'll lay up in the hospital and all that like maybe it's uh God's really trying to tell me to give my body a break, you know? Well, like, the, the crazy thing about it is who starts a pro wrestling career in their late 30s other than Diamond Dallas Page? Yeah, I was almost 40. Yeah. Yeah, when I started. Uh, yeah, you got DDP beat. He was, I think, 35. And, and you know what? I would have been fine if I just would have stuck to my big, big guy moves, you know? But no, I, like, start feeling good. I feel like, oh, my God, I'm learning and I'm getting better. And I just had a great match with Nick Aldis in Minnesota at MAW, like a 20-minute match, main event. Like, I was really happy with it. And then I just, uh, you know, insisted on flying off the top rope and, like, you know, when you're 44, you got to be a little smarter than that. And that's not such a good idea. But it felt good. It was easy. I did no problem a hundred times. Yeah. And then I have one landing where it just, I don't even know what happened. Like it, uh, it felt fine. Like I, I landed it like I normally do. And it just, um, you know, my bones couldn't handle it. Maybe the ring was a little harder, but uh, yeah, vertebrae in my back just gave out. So what, uh, what made you want to start wrestling in your late 30s? Well, I always knew when I growing up as a little kid in the 80s, um, you know, we, we didn't have the UFC. So we had Hulk Hogan, yeah. Ultimate Warrior, and <laughs> pro wrestling. And I, I always saw myself doing it, you know, like me and my brothers would pretend pro wrestle and, you know, take some mattresses out in the yard and, uh, you know, the video camera and, you know, act like we were the pro wrestlers. And I, I always... Yeah, you know, going through class as a little kid. What do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, I want to be a pro wrestler. Uh, it was like my dream. And I, you know, I visioned myself doing it. Um, and then, of course, in the 90s when the UFC came out, I totally fell in love with that. And I'd be daydreaming about that. And, you know, I just love martial arts. And more than anything was that martial arts fanatic. And knew, like, from UFC 1, but, like, you got to know everything. You got to know everything. And I had been... Uh, you know, wrestling, um, you know, since I was 10 and I joined the Taekwondo school at 12. So I did those through high school and was actually like for, for that era was pretty well-rounded, you know, getting in street fights. I had good ground and good striking <laughs> looking back on it. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, and that, uh, Unfortunately, there's no boxing in Northwest Indiana, Munster, Indiana. So it wasn't until I moved to Chicago after Purdue that I started going to the, you know, inner city boxing gyms and, and learning the, the art of boxing, um, which, you know, it's just another martial art. And, uh, you know, I fell in love with that and had the, I, I, you go through these phases. Oh, jujitsu is the shit. It's all about jujitsu and, you know, eat, sleep and ship jujitsu. And, and then you get, you, he discovered the boxing and start doing amateur bouts and smokers and the Golden Gloves tournament and you win it and oh you just love boxing and you're recording the ESPN classic and and um, just learning the sweet science of boxing um, and that's the beauty of MMA it's like um, you know you go on the football field and you know what's your vertical jump how fast could you run the forty a lot of shits yeah. dependent on that and I was you know never really athletic i was pretty slow and no vertical jump but like the mixed martial art was the one thing where it was so much more mental it was more about technique and finding holes in people's games where you didn't need that athletic ability and then that time too the jujitsu is this big secret and like mm. no one really knew it and there weren't too many jujitsu schools around so you know um getting to be a part of a good jujitsu school like the Carlson Gracie School in Chicago from 
you know, early on, it, it just felt like a nice advantage, you know, like I knew stuff other people didn't. You could beat guys who were more athletic than you. Yeah. Like wrestling in high school, I, I couldn't even qualify for state for my senior year. I wasn't like that good, and I was a really late bloomer. I was a beanpole. I wrestled at 170 on weight gainers, you know. Like I never <laughs> thought I'd crack 200 pounds. And, um, you know, it, 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 probably my eighth fight, I fought Brad Lind, who in high school in Illinois, which is usually a tougher school, won state twice, state champion. Here we are in MMA, and I'm able to beat him relatively easy just because of my mo more well-rounded game. And, yeah. like, the beauty of MMA is, like, you could do whatever you want pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's... There's, they call boxing the sweet science, but my goodness, you know, you put all the martial arts in the MMA and it is the sweetest science. It's like um, biochemistry, molecular biology. Uh, and, and that's what I fell in love with. And wrestling as a little kid, I was always like the tall, lanky, late bloomer kid wrestling the shorter guys who were muscular who'd be in on my legs. And more than anything, I just won the knee him in the face. And my first match, Brian Ebersol, 2001 Ironheart Crown, finally tries to take me down. I sprawl, cross-face <laughs> him, and just drill him with a couple knees. And it felt so good. And I eventually... Because you can't do that in wrestling. <laughs> yes, I yeah. finally got to do that. Oh, I've been wanting to do that for so long. And I choked him out in the next round, and... It was a four-man tournament, and I go back, and uh, the other side of my bracket, one of the guys pulled out, so you had a bye. So they're going to be like, all right, we're going to do the finals next. So, you know, there's a bye on the other side of the bracket, so you're going to fight again. I'm like, oh, my God, I just finished fighting. <laughs> like, well, and I went to stand up, and those two knees I gave them were right on that teardrop muscle in my quad. And, oh, my God, it hurts so bad. <laughs> like, uh -huh. I went to take a step, and I couldn't. And it was like, how am I going to go in there and fight? Um, but once the bell rang and a couple punches started whizzing by my head, that adrenaline set in and, right. and yeah, I was able to pull it off. After you made a name for yourself in UFC, were there opportunities for you to get into pro wrestling at that time? <clears throat> no, I never explored it really. Did anyone ever reach out to you? No. That's interesting. Cause there were a lot of people from UFC that were going to WWE or impact or back in Oh five. Well, I mean, Brock Lesnar would be obviously the first one that would. Oh, he was kind of the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was just getting my, like, UFC career started, and, um, like, pro wrestling was the farthest thing from my mind, you know? Um, well, Ken Shamrock, I guess, would be the, the I had, first person. Yeah. Yep. I had to get sick of MMA and, <laughs> and fighting, and then long And then retire. For it. And then, yeah. Yeah. And long, like, oh, my God. Like, you know, life's all about... Uh, making those childhood fantasies come to life. You know, all those things you pictured myself doing as a little kid, like, you know, hitting a badass pose after beating someone's ass in a crowded <laughs> yeah. arena. Like yeah. I dreamed of doing that as a kid. Yeah. Um, Do you have a favorite photo of you from your time in UFC? Favorite photo, boy, huh? There's always like a, that great, epic, iconic photo of every fighter that encapsulates like a, an amazing moment. I mean, yeah, it's it's um, shitty pixelation, but it's on my computer. It was after second Kristoff fight. After I stopped him, I got up and, went and looked at the camera and yeah. just gave a badass pose. Uh, yeah, and that's something as a little kid I imagined doing. Um, yeah. You know, and just seeing it come to life. That's I heard someone say that's what miracles are. Miracles are when you see your imagination come to life. Mm, like, I love That's that. That's a beautiful quote. Yeah. You know, started using that in my stand-up routine. Yeah. That, you know. that, although that doesn't sound that funny. Well, no, that's just the start. And then you go into like, um, for example, you know, I love Bruce Lee, right? Like I wanted to be Bruce Lee. I watched End of the Dragon at least a hundred times and thought I was Bruce Lee. You should see me on the nunchucks. I'm amazing. I posted a video on my IG doing it. You could still view my IG. I just can't get in. We'll it. figure that out. Um, so I was Bruce Lee. Like, this is it. Like, fucking, um, you know, had the black kung fu pants and the sash and the little kung fu shoes and would run around the house with nunchucks thinking I was Bruce Lee. And then um, I'm fighting Machida uh, in 2003 in Manaus, Brazil. So we fly into uh, 
Rio. I train there for a few days and fly to Manaus, long flight, like six hour flight. We land. I think I'm going to a hotel. No, we go to a boating dock. They're like, yeah, get on the boat. I'm like, what, what's this? And next thing you know, a couple hours thick in the Amazon river. And we come up on this ecotourism resort that's built in the middle of the Amazon River, like in the middle. And it was just like, holy shit, man. Wow. Going to a remote island for a martial arts fighting competition. Like, are you kidding you me? You are Bruce Lee. I'm like, this is it. <laughs> this is Enter the Dragon, man. Like, wow, this is a miracle. This is my imagination coming to life. <laughs> and then, you know, Machida, he's half Japanese, uh, half Brazilian. And the fight's going on, and he's got this, like, open-hand style, and he's really elusive. And, like, I had been boxing for a while. I'm not telegraphing anything. I fire off some punches. He slips my right hand, cracks me with the counter punch, slips my left hand, gets out of the way. My nose is bleeding. And I'm like, holy shit, this guy's pretty good. And, like, <laughs> we start going at it again. I was able to time one of his kicks. I caught him with a right, a left, a couple good knees. And, like, I'm like, get up really excited like oh i got him some danger and we both fire punches and i just feel the warm blood coming down next thing you know the referee's lifting up his head then it just hits me in my head i'm like oh my god i am an answer the dragon but <laughs> he's bruce lee i'm stupid john fucking roper bleeding all over my white pasty hairy chest just like roper in the movie it's a good bet <laughs> So, so that's kind of <laughs> yeah. the imagination coming to life in the stand-up routine. Right. There you go. But I, I have a bunch of those. So that's, that's part of my, my act is I, I go yeah. through a couple examples. I think with The Ultimate Fighter, a lot of people want to immediately talk to you about the Forrest Griffin fight. But I want to take it back before that. What was the audition like and, and the casting like for The Ultimate Fighter? It was um, something I heard about... Um, well, last minute in terms of like sending a tape and I was at my jujitsu school and guys were talking about it. And just the week before I went to the contender tryouts at the Windy City Boxing oh, Gym. Wow. Frank Stallone was running them. And I went in there with a guy who was all juiced up on roids, but didn't know how to box. So I beat the shit out of him. <laughs> and that was like the audition. And like, I was excited. I'm like, I'm going to probably make the show. I look yeah. great in there. And, uh, you know, jujitsu, they're talking about it and they're like, hey, Bonnie, you think about going out for that show? The ultimate, the one the UFC's having, the ultimate fighter. I'm like, no, no, I tried out for it. You're, you're mistaken. That's a boxing show called <laughs> The Contender, Stallone Sugar Rare. No, no, the UFC's doing one. No way. So go home that night and go to UFC.tv. That's before they even owned UFC.com. <laughs> And um, that's before I, I couldn't have done it there at school. It's before phones were that good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Could just look it up there. And sure enough, they're having a show, audition tapes due Friday. And they just want your fights on a tape um, with, uh, and then a little <clears throat> um, interview, like, just like you, a little bio, a little you just telling a two minute spiel about yourself. So that's what I put together and sent in. And, you know, I looked, it was like Tuesday, tapes were due Friday. So I had to overnight it. Um, and this is a VHS tape. <laughs> VHS, <laughs> baby. Yep. Uh, and and that, that's how I got the original call. You know, I had a good record. My only loss was the cut to Machida. I think it was like 7-1. And, um, yeah, I got the call that they're going to have us out for castings week. And that was my first time out to Vegas. They locked us in the palace station for a week. Like, weren't allowed to leave. You know, I was just looking out the windows every night at all the fun that was going on. And uh, they took you for, like, all your medicals and the drug tests and did a background check and then, you know, did some on-camera interviews with you. And from there, they had, like, 40 guys out. And from there, they narrowed it down to the 16 that you saw on the show. Wow. Um, so that was the pretty much the whole process of getting on. And then me and Bobby Southworth, we went to do medicals together. And, um, and right before that, I still have the poster and the Ironheart crown. I was champion. I was supposed to fight Bobby, defend my title. And uh, uh, we had a fight scheduled while we were on the Ultimate Fighter. So here we are on the Ultimate Fighter getting the medicals done and like not knowing. I'm like, oh, you're Bobby Southworth? Yeah, we're supposed to fight. Well, fight might not happen if we're on this show. I'm like, well, if we're on the show, the fight might happen. <laughs> yeah. you know? Sure enough, we both got chosen for the show, and uh, we had a tough fight. Uh, 
that first fight of mine, and uh, I won a close one. And really what I attribute the win um, to getting a bad staph infection. If I wouldn't have got that staph infection, I wouldn't have won that fight. Um, Wait, on the show, I, there was how does a, that work? There was an impetigo outbreak. If you notice, I'm not in that episode at all where everyone got taken out for a night on the town and got drunk and the drama happened between Lieben and Bobby Southworth and Koscheck. Yeah. Um, I was nowhere to be found that episode. And another episode, too, barely in it. Um, that's because I, uh, there, there was a staff outbreak and I ended up getting the, the worst of it. I had an impetigo pretty good. And, you know, they gave me a couple, like, high-powered antibiotic shots and give me like a z-pack and they went and locked me up in the hacienda hotel over by um the hoover dam for a couple days Man. but like randy couture had overtrained us so bad like i wasn't able to sleep i was shaking i was dog shit i was so weak like he killed us. Like the amount of volume that guy could handle training is just nothing short of amazing. All of us, a lot of the guys were really beat up and overtrained. And um, yeah, had I like just had to fight Bobby and continued training those next couple of days with the team, yeah. like there's no way I would have been able to pull it off. So that gave you the rest that, that you needed. That staph infection <laughs> gave me a couple of days to let my body recover. And I remember coming back and getting under the bench with like 135 and it felt like a feather and I was like, yes. And they're like, oh, oh my God, Bonner, you won't believe what happened. Oh, gosh, <laughs> cost checking Bobby with Lieben and sprayed him with the hose after we went out and all hell broke loose and Lieben smashed up the house. You have to fight Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> you have to break up him and Koscheck. Those two together are the biggest assholes. And it, 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 it was true. Like, either of those guys on their own, I got along with no problem. But when they were just together, they had this, like, obnoxious aura that just came out of them that made it hard to deal with. And, yeah. like, we got to yeah. break those two up. We got to get Bobby out of the house. And, um, and I'm like, well, it's not really my fight to fight, but... Like I had a, we had a poster made. I was supposed to fight the dude anyway. So he's, I just looked at him like, he's my guy. Like God wants me to fight him. Yeah. So, so here we go. Let's do it. So I chose him to fight and you know, the rest is history. Did you know when you got on the show that Forrest Griffin was someone to watch out for? Uh, no, I didn't know who he was or anything, but yeah, after, like you know, when you see him training, did you yes. go, Oh wow. After a couple of days, see Chuck picked Bobby first, so everyone thought Bobby was the most talented. Even Forrest, he kind of, you know, uh, Bobby kind of coached him in a way, way like big brother to him. That's kind of Bobby's attitude. So Forrest kind of didn't realize he was probably better than Bobby, I think. That's yeah. how I've kind of viewed huh. it. So everyone, he was like the team captain and the first pick. And, you know, it's just the first few days. So, you know, uh, you really don't know yet. Um, so he was really the guy to beat. But I knew, like just from the first few days me and Forrest were going at it a little bit and we even got headbutts and I got a cut um so I knew like he was no joke you know and I knew for his first fight ever he fought Dan Severn which I thought oh my God. freaking ever hilarious you know I'm like wow how ballsy your first fight ever like wow a heavyweight like wow. you know it's impressive I don't know did he win that fight no I like lost the decision you know but you know Severn just took him down and you know pretty much uh oh well, he outsized him right yeah just one with his wrestling didn't hurt him or anything Forrest just played guard man at any point during that epic match with Forrest Griffin. Did you think that you were going to win that match? Yeah. In the second round, um, when I almost had him out of there, like I really, uh, um, I remember it so clearly, like, um, we're in the clinch and I just land, I broke his nose. I landed some good shots. And from the clinch, I just drilled him with the perfect knee mm -hmm. and then a short right hand. And he mm -hmm. slumped back towards the, the cage and, Oh my God, that was it. I got a little adrenaline bust. Is like a burst. Like, this is it. You got to put him away. You got to knock him out. And I lunge in and like do a jumping right hand that just missed. And he was able to tie my arms up. And I remember when I wiggled and got my arms free, I went to punch him again. And it just hit me like I had nothing left. Like, nothing. Like, I couldn't even lift my arms up. I was so dead dog tired. And then. From there, I was just running on fumes. So, uh, 
you know, the third round I thought was a coin toss. And um, looking back on it, though, um, you know, a lot of people come up to me and try to be nice and say, oh, I thought you won that fight, I thought you won that fight. But um, the reality of it, the way I look at it is like the right person won that night. That was like the perfect storybook ending. If you remember, you know, when Forrest loses a decision mm -hmm. or, you know, he doesn't do too well with defeat, you know, he's known to run out the octagon crying. Or when he beat Tito the last time, he ran out the octagon throwing a temper tantrum and they had to call him back in to tell him he won the split decision. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. had I won that night, yeah. like, it might not have been the nice feel-good storybook ending that we had. And I think that was really important because it was all about putting the sport over and um, getting the sport to be accepted. And, uh, and it was, and the ending was perfect and well, beautiful, and, and I wouldn't change it. And so many things happened during the course of that show and that fight that made the UFC bl blow up from there. You know, it's Sp Spike TV, reality TV was a big thing at the time. You have this absolute barn burner of a fight that could have gone either way throughout the fight. And then you guys both end up getting a contract. It's like all these boxes end up getting ticked. Yeah, that's like Dana White says, you know, like the heavens and stars and everything aligned just perfectly. And it was what was delivered was exactly what we needed. You know, they were yeah. hanging by a thread. And like right after that, they went back and signed for three more seasons, which just totally cemented it. Um, uh, but like in my head, like I, I was really confident the show was going to be a huge success. I, I just, and I was really confident the fight was going to be a barn burner. Like that was my strategy to make it a barn burner. Um, and, uh, and it was, uh, so UFC sold for as much as it did. I mean, kind it, of off the back of a fight like that, which led to a bunch of other fights, which led to where I, it is I, now. I like what Frank Mir says. He describes it as the BCAD line of MMA, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to get out of the stone age and just yeah. propelled it forward. Seriously. As a legitimate sport. And it, yeah, yeah. See, before that fight, it, it, was, it wasn't really socially acceptable to be a fan. You know, it wasn't something you, you wanted your boss to know or, you know, your, your wife's parents, like that you were really into that stuff. And uh, after that fight, people became proud to be fans. Do you think we're encroaching on that now with what's going on in boxing? Because there's a lot of people who didn't really care about boxing till about a year ago. And Jake Paul and Logan Paul have made it interesting. That's actually a really good point. Um, yeah, that, uh, that's a hell of a point. I didn't, didn't think of it like that. Just what they're doing overall for boxing, yeah, it's just bringing a lot of eyeballs that normally wouldn't tune into it to it. And it's going to turn people into a lot of bo straight-up boxing fans, not just Jake Paul fans. Or just people. I think people are watching Jake Paul's fights because they don't like Jake Paul. Like, he's the uh, ultimate yeah. heel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Really, people hate him. Like he's got. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He, I mean, that just comes with it. Like you know, but he's got a ton of fans. I'm sure he does for you sure. Know, from YouTube days and all yeah. that, those and podcast, diehard old yeah. school fans. Uh, so, yeah, but when you get that big, you know, it just a bunch of people are gonna hate you. When you got millions of people judging you, <laughs> you know, you're gonna get hundreds yeah. of thousands of haters. Uh, do you think it would be more difficult for you if you were breaking into UFC now with the way it's structured? Yeah, definitely. Guys have really evolved. The athlete has. And it's like, um, yeah, I think it would just be harder overall. Uh, Probably a lot more money in it now. Like, did you see this crypto.com deal? I'm sure you did. No, with like the UFC. $175 million. A sponsorship? Sponsorship for all the fight gear. So for all the walkout stuff. $175 million. Wow. Didn't they just go from Reebok yep. to Venom and they're already done with Venom? It's, it's Crypto.com and Venom. So it's Venom clothes with Crypto.com on it. And, and you know, living here in Vegas, you see Crypto.com like everywhere. It's on the yeah. side of, it's going to be the name of the Staples Center. Probably wow. by the time this episode comes out. In LA? Yeah. They renamed the state. It? It's, it's now called the Crypto.com Arena. Get out of here. Yeah. It's a lot. That's a crazy thing. 
But all this is to say there's a lot of money if you were 20 years old and looking to get into MMA. Yeah, that's true. Um, there is, but uh, most of the guys in the UFC aren't, aren't getting paid too well. It's just the guys at the top. You know, you fight for the title, and that's really what changes everything. Mm. Um, it, you know, usually you get that title fight, and you get a boost in pay, and then if you win the title, forget about it. You know, there's some big paydays right there for that fight, and then that fight after. Even if you lose it, like Forrest, those two fights got him, you know, kind of his retirement right there. Uh, so comparatively, all those guys that, you know, grind their way up and never really get, um, you know, up in title contention, yeah. yeah, they're not doing too well. It's not like something they could retire on it's not like other pro sports yeah. not even close you know uh, it sounds like it maybe would possibly be changing in the future that maybe maybe there's some sort of a bargaining agreement or something possibly one day yeah or um a union a union yeah, yeah. <laughs> like uh yeah this is the exact same thing that happened to the you know baseball and football players before they started unions you know they got shitty paydays and the owners took advantage of them and, yeah you know it's just the way it is i know in most pro sports between the owners and fighters it's about 50 50 but the ufc um i know a while back it was like 90 10 or even you know a little more than that so Man. yeah that gives you an idea but uh you know that's uh the evolution of the sport yeah i i you know i i equate my career and like back to you know when you see the nba games of the the guys wearing the little short shorts <laughs> yeah. like that's yeah that's kind of how i feel about uh i don't know you my were a division of mma you were one progression past my that, alumni. i think I, th I think when you watch hoist gracie and fighting in a gi still i think yeah. it's like that's the bc time yeah that's true that's true but yeah. uh yeah, I even seen the, the when I first started fighting the little fight shorts. I fought in the little speedos, like not speedos, but the little uh, you know the tight shorts like GSP wears. Yeah, uh, the bicycle shorts. Yeah, everyone wore those. I couldn't even get board shorts. I you know no one sold them. And then um, you know you get in the UFC in '04, and it was all the board shorts and the team shorts were the board shorts. In my whole career, it was board shorts. Yeah. And then I hang it up, and I it's like that style of the tight ones is coming back around and. Uh, then I go into pro wrestling, and I'm like, man, well, it's, it's back in style, so I'm going to put the tight ones back on. So what, was, what was the goal when you went into pro wrestling? Because you went right into impact wrestling, at least publicly, like that's what people saw. Yeah. Was it to go in there and win a championship, or was it to just go have some fun? It was just to have a new weekend hobby. You know, like uh, I, I just needed to – get that adrenaline high and go out there, break a sweat and entertain, you know, I love entertaining uh, the fans. So like the pro wrestling was, it was just like freedom. It was um, me being able to travel and do something fun that wasn't so serious. And you know, it's like traveling for free, you even make a little money. You know, I did all right in merch too. Uh, so I'll never forget walking by your merch table and you had a pre-signed photos, pre-signed by Forrest Griffin, and then you signed the other part. I'm like, that is brilliant. Oh yes, those are my best sellers. Yeah, of course they are. A, take a stack to Forrest with a hundred dollar bill and have them go to work. <laughs> Everybody then... listening right now is like, damn, I can buy one of those. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. Stephen Bonner's merch table. Whole stack at home. <laughs> So yeah, the merch, that was always fun for me. In the UFC, I, I had a company that did uh, their t-shirts, their event t-shirts when they you know, travel around the country or the world. Um, so that, that was always fun for me. So it was a chance for me to kind of scratch that uh, adrenaline itch, go out there and entertain, and uh, gave me a reason to go to the gym and lift weights. You know, um, And it was like a nice weekend hobby to have. Uh, it, it, I really felt like free doing it you know like a sense of freedom um who'd you train with when you're out there i went here to fsw to just really just learn the ropes is, learn that, the, is that where delo is yeah yeah it's the only school here now yeah. i think I, I don't know if that uh i know jake the snake school closed i don't know there may be another one um but yeah, that i is, think there is yeah the, the las vegas well, i don't want to piss anyone off but <laughs> fsw future stars of wrestling 
was pretty much the main school. When I started, when I wanted to go learn how to do the pro wrestling, well, just like learn, learn the basics, learn how to take bumps. Yeah. And that's what you do. You go in there and learn the basics and how to take bumps, but you really learn pro wrestling by doing it, you know, by going out there and, and doing it and seeing what works and knowing how to engage the crowd and knowing how to put together a good match. And that's all I wanted. I kind of wanted to learn the art of pro wrestling, have that sense of freedom. Um, and I felt like I, I got to that point, like that match with Nick Aldis, where it was like just a nice, safe, entertaining, you know, 20 minute match that, uh, went smoothly and like, ah, you know, like I yeah. could die happy. Um, because that was the thing I had the problem with. Um, it was at first it was really easy doing five minute matches, you know, really easy to remember, but I had the biggest problem with like remembering the match, uh, and, and, um, <clears throat> and also how to engage the crowd and how to play the crowd and how to slow down a little bit. Uh, so that's kind of what I wanted to just go in there, new weekend hobby and like, you know, approach it as a martial art, like yeah. I'm learning the art of pro wrestling. Um, and you never officially retire from pro wrestling, but no. after, you know, you have a broken vertebrae yeah, as you sit I mean, here right I'm, now. I'm definitely on a little hiatus from it. And that was the, the thing, like, you know, I, I got severely injured here and, um, you know, when you think about it, it's kind of God's way of telling me to find a new weekend hobby. That's so, the way I'm looking at it. But is it know? also find a new job? Like, what are, what are you doing these days? Well, I bankroll my wife's company, Glitter Sparkle Studio. Um, check that out, glittersparklestudio.com. Oh, it? It's like a crafting website. Um, oh, if you have a daughter or anything like that, check it out. You make, like, crafts, earrings, bows, and... Um, uh, um, the bulk of the business is selling dyes, and those are the things you put the pa fabric over that cuts out the pattern of the bow. So um, that's the business, a crafting business that specializes in selling dyes for for bows, for like you know girls' birthday parties, and you know um, yeah yeah. So my wife's really brilliant, and uh, you know she was a producer at Fox back in the day, and then moved here and worked for MGM, but then quit and uh you know was kind of chilling for a while had my son and all that and uh it was like a, a shame letting that brilliance go to waste so like finally she came to me and she's like i got an idea like i know i could start a business give me 10 grand and it was i was so happy to give her the money to start <laughs> the business uh because i you know knew how smart she was and knew she uh uh, be successful at it so and she was it was it's been going for a couple of years now and doing really well so i do that i have my ameritrade account i have my coinbase account i take gigs color commentating um, um part owner of uh high tiva it's search learn and source cannabis for, for pickup or delivery we have the largest video strain review library which i've written most of those uh reviews actually um <coughs> So, but I need a new weekend hobby. The pro wrestling, I need to give it, my body a break. Could and, it be signing autographs with Forrest Griffin? Could that not be a weekend hobby? You I, probably, I, you already do that so much, I'm no, sure. I, I, I got it, I got it. Like, I've probably done stand-up comedy at least uh, a dozen times now. And I've done it enough times to know that something's there. Yeah. Like, uh, in my last... Uh, last time I went up and did a set, it, it was a tough crowd. There were a lot of comics there. And I seen other really experienced comics do pretty bad. And I went up and had a great set. Mm. Uh, so after getting off the stage, I was like, there's something there, you know? And then, uh, but of course I had a bunch of pro wrestling gigs lined up and other things going on. So, you know, I didn't, you know, really go after it uh, because my life was pretty fulfilled um, and I wasn't too hungry for anything. My weekends were scheduled up with pro wrestling. So, um, you know, that uh, that set I was talking about was back in the summer in like July. So, uh, yeah, early September is when I went into the hospital and, um, you know, I've had a lot of time to think about it then. And like, like I said earlier, it's kind of God's way of telling me to, find a new weekend hobby and why not like so it's just comedy. And, and per capita like 
Vegas has more comedy clubs than probably any other city. You and know, the, even Chicago's the like number three biggest city, and there's just a couple of them. And here, like TV market, we're like 37 in terms yeah. of city size. But you look at the uh, opportunities for comedy, and not just the comedy clubs, but other places that do comedy and have the open mics and have yeah. comedy. A lot of bars have them, and, and a lot of comedians here too. There's like really not a better city to learn the art of stand-up comedy than las vegas so yeah really when i'm doing my yoga in the morning that's the, the only thing that really has a desire to like what i like to learn and develop like uh skills in it's that so i've been studying it more looking at comics and writing down material and and the hardest thing is getting started and really like um coming on this show and just saying this right now yes. is probably the biggest step it's comparable to before i first started fighting when i signed up for the iron heart crown in 2001 that's when it became real that's when it became real i'm someone who sticks to my word so just by coming out here and letting this out right now it's like i am i have to follow through now i know? love this you've you've made yourself accountable to this yes stefan bonner the stand-up comedian so I mean, there it is. yeah. It's has has any start? Uh, have any comics here in Las Vegas kind of taken you under their wing or given you some pointers? Because there's a lot here. Yeah, Adam Hunter got me started. He let me go up on his shows a couple times at the LA Comedy Club and then at the Dirty at twelve thirty at the South Point, and then I hosted um, at Sophia's Strip Club a, a comedy night. And those were my first couple gigs. I and hope then, you kept your clothes on for that. <laughs> Just the ladies did. I did. I did. <laughs> so I've done it enough times to, that I have had like, you know, bad sets and learn from them. And like, like my first time ever doing comedy was the Sophia strip club in the dirty at 1230. And just from the first to second set, I made a ton of improvement. Um, sure. By, you know, just took in what worked in the first set and sticking to that trimming the stuff that didn't. And the second set was way better than the first. And then, uh, um, since then I've, done some open mics i want to open my contest with a good number of comics on it so i know there's hey, something there yeah. and it's something that uh you know i i could just like i did with martial arts like you know just want to learn yeah like the art of stand-up yeah so, so you're saying right now you're like a white belt in mm -hmm. comedy yeah right now you've certainly I'm got a, the white belt mentality too. i'm a white belt with Probably some stripes, you know? Okay. Like a decent white belt, yeah, like I was in jiu-jitsu. But yeah. uh, one of the best, some of the best advice I got um, on doing the comedy was from one of my students uh, when I still had my gym and was teaching. He was a comic uh, back east, you know? And uh, he goes, I'm like, oh, I got a gig coming up, my first comedy gig. Give me some pointers, you know? He's like, well, probably the best thing I could give you is, you're going to suck for a few years. You, know? <laughs> you got to go through yeah. your ropes. You got to suck. You got to have your bad sets. You got to learn the, the, you know, learn, learn, learn the craft, son, learn the craft, log in your hours, 10,000 yeah. hours to get that black yeah. belt. So, yeah. uh, and that's a good thing. Like, I feel like in the little experience I've had, I've gotten like the super shitty, like those, those first couple times that were really shitty. So, um, I've gotten that out of my system. So now when I have a shitty set, it'll be more because I'm working on new material. Uh, and, well, and hopefully it's just less shitty than your shittiest set. Yeah. yeah. The, the shitty level just <laughs> decreases by a, a, yeah. a, a ass wipe or two. I'm happy. <laughs> but what a progression. UFC fighter, UFC Hall of Famer, pro wrestler. Now you're a stand-up comedian. Wow. That's scary when you yeah. say it like that. That's where you're at. So, time to start hanging out at the comedy clubs. That's it. Yeah, I started watching that show, I'm Dying Up Here. Yeah. Have you seen it? Yeah. So, yeah, that makes you want to do some comedy. Yeah. Well, just being around it, right? Like, every, every comedian I've interviewed or any of my friends that are comedians, they're just like, you have to be around it. And you have to get on stage. They're like, it's one thing to be sitting in the stage or sitting in the audience, but you got to get up. So, it sounds like that's what you're doing. Yeah, uh, that's the plan. <laughs> that is the plan. We're putting it out in the world now. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I, 
I said, you know, hey, time to start hanging out at comedy clubs. But, but yes, uh, with the implication that I'm going to go grab the mic and tell yeah. some jokes. Uh, so, yeah, new weekend hobby, man. How yeah. about it? On this, this show, this, making it official. There it is. Time Prob to start. Uh, probably won't break your back out. doing that. So, start off with just um, find a good mic one a week. Once a week. That's really like when I commit to doing something once a week that – that's magical. Even like, you know, when you're first learning the new martial arts, if I did at least do it two days a week, like I'd get better. So that means you're going to do 52 sets next year, Stefan. New Year's resolution, 52 sets next Damn, year. Damn, I love it. I've loved having you come by. You are a great storyteller, so I can't wait to see how your comedy is going to evolve from here. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Comedy, um, when I think about it, oh my God, I'm going up and telling jokes and doing comedy. It's it's way harder than when I say, oh, I'm just going to tell some of my funny stories. Well, can't you just reach out to Brendan Schaub? Are you guys friends? You could just open for him. Right? Yeah, seriously. That'd be good. Look at the transition he, he's made. Yeah. Um, like he's, Brendan Schaub. He's really like, talk about going right to the top. Like that kind of scares me. Like his progression was so fast. Like, he has a lot of the right friends. Uh, yeah, he got groomed and he got like his own special right away and like headlighting right away. I, I want to do like, I, I don't want to headline right away. I just want to do like 15 minute sets and help open for people, but just kind of go around the country. Well, I'll learn the ropes here, hmm. but just once I, how about this for my new year's resolution? Okay, I do the 52 go. sets in Vegas next year. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, uh, 2023 tour the country. Bam. And, um, yeah, just go around open for people, uh, and go to, yeah, I mean, fuck, man, see the world, see the world again through the eyes of a comedian. I've yeah. seen it through the eyes of a pro wrestler, through the eyes of a mixed martial artist and also working for the UFC all that time. Uh, but now you yeah. rediscover the world, you know, <laughs> through the eyes of a comedian. Talk love it. about keeping you young. I love it. I end every conversation with the same questions. So like, I'm all, I'm all about gratitude. I love being able to wake up every day and talk about the things I'm grateful for. I list three things every morning. What are three things in your life that you're grateful for? Ah, ah, gratitude, gratitude. Um, I'm thankful uh, just to be in a country where you're free. Um, I'm seeing this tyranny go around all over the world, man. Australia's scaring me. And yeah, we have our problems here, but man, I'm I so thankful to be in a, a country where you could kind of speak your mind and uh, and be yourself, and you just have that kind of freedom. That man, I always thought Australia and Canada were pretty free, man. But just um, the stuff that's been going on there, it, it's tyrannical. Uh, and I feel for those guys. And, you know, I stay and talked about myself a lot, but I really didn't talk about political stuff, you know, about the, you know, COVID and all that and the vaccine and yada, yada. And I think it's important that, you know, we do, that uh, we address those things, um, honestly. So don't give the vaccine to kids, man. That's just evil, all right? I just wanted to get that out. Okay, two more things I'm thankful for. Oh, my car. Um, I love my car, BMW 328i. Uh, I'm thankful for um, just my son, my family, right? Yeah. Uh, Your son named after Forrest Griffin. Well, named after a moment in history now. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Don't get there. Yeah, it right. wasn't Forrest. Yeah. No. It's the Bonner-Griffin fight. It's the true. The Griffin-Bonner fight. Yeah, you can, your name should go first, right? What do you think? Well, his name's Griffin Bonner. Oh, I, yeah, yeah. So I just yeah, I, I see what you did. <laughs> Stefan, thank you so much for coming by. Well, thanks for having me, Chris. Uh, it was good. It was uh, good to kind of to get out again, man. I was on thank my deathbed for, coming by, for a while. Yeah. You're not dying anymore. You're living. I was worried I was gonna croak, but uh, oh. I'm alive and well. And um, you know, time to reinvent myself, turn over a new leaf, the new American psycho.
Stefan Bonner, UFC Hall of Famer, the game changer, the face rearranger. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>